<clears throat> border security. Uh, ben asked me to, to talk about um, what's happening along the border um, and also, uh, before I finish, uh, talk about how the uh, security issues impacting our border uh, will impact uh, the 2012 elections. And that's important because we need to keep in mind that there are two elections that are taking place in two 2012, not only one here in the U.S., but one in Mexico as well, both very, very important, obviously. So the threats along the southwest border. Let's talk about the conventional threats initially, then I'll talk about the unconventional threats and make a few comments on uh, the southwest border strategy, and then we'll move into the political piece of this. But the conventional threats. I don't think most Americans, those who you're, you're supporting, uh, have a clear understanding of what's playing out in Mexico. Um, <clears throat> not that they wouldn't be interested, but uh, they just have absolutely no clue what they're up against. When you ask most Americans uh, what comes to mind when you, uh, when you think of organized crime, most of them will say, well, John Gotti, Al Capone, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Uh, you know, names like that, traditional Italian and Sicilian organized crime figures from the United States. Those guys and uh, that threat pales in comparison to what we're facing in Mexico, uh, just across our border. The Mexican uh, drug trafficking cartels are global in nature. Uh, they are moving into places or have moved into places like West Africa, North Africa. Uh, they're all over Latin America, obviously. Uh, they've shown up in places like Iran. They've shown up in places like southern China, for God's sakes. John Gotti, on his best day, could not have put together a million dollars in cash. He simply couldn't do it. Uh, Chapo Guzman, on the other hand, loses $25 million at a time uh, to U.S. and Mexican law enforcement uh, and other security forces, and he doesn't skip a beat. <clears throat> Highly compartmentalized or, or highly sophisticated organizational structures, both operationally and organizationally. Highly compartmentalized cells, just like uh, terrorist organizations, Middle Eastern terrorist organizations. They rely on the latest in technology to shoot, move, and communicate. Uh, and most importantly, they rely, rely heavily on the hallmarks of organized crime. Corruption, intimidation, and violence. If they can't corrupt you, they'll intimidate you. If they can't intimidate you and succeed, they'll turn to brutal, brutal violence. Let's think about this for just a minute. Last year, not, that I know of, not one single beheading in uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, yet there were over 300 last year in Mexico. <clears throat> Courtney and I see what's called a KNR report that is put out uh, uh, by Mexico uh, every day. If you're interested in it, we'd be happy to send you a copy of it uh, just to get a flavor for what's happening down there. But I can't remember a day that's gone by when there have, have not been multiple reports of dismembered bodies, beheadings, brutal tortures, you name it. A federal congressman was recently kidnapped uh, on September the 4th and his driver, they were just found um, deceased, uh, was not a shock to anyone uh, just, uh, just yesterday. Uh, but most of, most of America doesn't really understand what's going on south of the border and how it can impact uh, the United States. Let's also keep something in mind that's very important. Mexico is our third greatest trading partner, third largest trading partner. 85% of that trade takes place within 15 miles of either side of the border, or 85% of the revenue generated from that trade, I should say, uh, takes place or plays out within that 30-mile mile uh, area. And folks, it, it is all about uh, our, our shared economies. If Mexico fails in their fight, if they, if they fail to win, if they throw in the towel, uh, if the PRI wins the next election in 2012 and goes back to their old ways of simply accepting payoffs and turning their heads, then folks, um, life in our country and life in Mexico as we know it, I believe, will change forever, especially along that southwest, uh, southwest border. The unconventional threat. The last time I was here, I talked about the growing confluence of drugs and terror. It continues to grow. Well over half of the designated terrorist organizations, those designated by the State Department and the one designated by Congress, the Taliban, uh, uh, that 
that confluence continues to grow. These groups are involved in one or more aspects of the global drug trade because we have succeeded in prosecuting our war on terror and shut off funding streams, the more traditional funding streams, from state sponsors as well as from very powerful private donors. And that continues to play out. There's clear evidence and well, I should, let me back up. We have known for years uh, that groups like Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda have been heavily involved in places like the tri-border area of Latin America and that they have been moving north uh, for quite some time. There's growing evidence, folks, uh, that, uh, that the Hezbollah is, is clearly in, uh, in Central America, the Isthmus of Central America. They're moving into Mexico if they're not already there. Um, if it, folks, <laughs> And the Hezbollah is heavily involved in the global cocaine trade now. Uh, I've got a, although it's a bit dated, uh, the FinCEN um, issued sanctions against the Lebanese Canadian bank, bank based on a DEA investigation that Courtney actually uh, supported in her previous life uh, before she reentered the private sector. <clears throat> And that, uh, uh, those sanctions against the Lebanese Canadian bank, uh, that, that bank is the most, uh, probably the most notorious uh, funding institution or financial institution that has been leveraged and exploited and used heavily by the Hezbollah for years. Um, Lebanese um, operatives in Latin America moving uh, multi tens and hundreds of tons uh, totally, in, in totality, uh, from Latin America into, uh, into West Europe and, and uh, on into Europe and the Middle East. We're, mo uh, we're moving as much as, laundering as much as $200 million a month uh, through that financial institution. When you put that into perspective, folks, the best estimates are that Iran, uh, the biggest sponsor of the Hezbollah, provides uh, the, the Hezbollah with about $200 million a year. Was all of that drug money going to fund the Hezbollah? No. Do we know how much? No, we don't. Uh, that should be alarming in and of itself. Suffice it to say that based on what I do know uh, from my previous job at DEA and all the briefings that I received on those investigations that led to those sanctions, uh, the Hezbollah is receiving hundreds of millions of dollars a year from their activity in the global drug trade. Again, clear signs that they're getting very, very close to home just across, uh, just across our shared border. That's the conventional threat. <clears throat> Let's talk about politics for a minute. I feel a little bit uh, uh, uneasy talking about politics. I'm not, a, I'm not a politician. I was a career service public servant at the local, state, and federal government for 33 years in law enforcement. Uh, but I am a voter, and, um, and I believe I have a fairly good understanding of what uh, my fellow citizens and voters are feeling all around the country and really those who are, who are serving around the world because I talk to them. Our company is doing work on the southwest border. We've performed work in support of law enforcement and security forces in Mexico. We're doing the same thing in Afghanistan. If anyone thinks for one single moment that the American public is not absolutely tuned in uh, to the border security issues and the greater immigration issue, they're all intertwined, they're all interlinked, then you couldn't be more wrong. I was down in El Paso just a couple of weeks ago, and I was down there for about a week on uh, one of the contracts that we have at the El Paso Intelligence Center. And I talked a lot of to a lot of folks in restaurants and elsewhere, and I'm telling you what, they know where their congressmen and congresswomen stand on the border issues, and that's where their votes are going. They're absolutely fed up. I worked on that border in the mid-1990s. I worked on that border again in the late 1990s and early 2000s with DEA. And quite honestly, there hasn't been a whole lot of change since those days, other than it's just continually gets worse and folks are fed up. Listen, the Hezbollah, you know, aren't stupid, and there have, you know, there are factions of the Hezbollah that have been involved in global organized crime for a long time. They've just, over the last few years, become more and more involved in the uh, in cocaine trafficking, um, and saw a, a tremendous opportunity as Europe's demand for cocaine began to grow, 
uh, their ability to uh, carve out uh, some niche areas, get get involved, and make and make uh, lots and lots of money. Again, my opinion, based on what I know about the Hezbollah and uh, the investigations that uh, DEA has had over many years targeting them, they could care less, uh, quite frankly, what they're how they're impacting uh, other countries. Uh, they they could just simply care less. If I could, and I spoke about this the last time I was here, um, what everyone in this room needs to understand also when it comes to our border um, with Mexico and the Mexican trafficking organizations and this entire, you know, this, this growing uh, uh, demand for cocaine in, uh, in Europe and some other places, <clears throat> those more and more loads of cocaine are headed to Western Europe now. In fact, the best estimates by Joint Interagency Task Force South down in, in uh, Key West is that within a year or two, there'll be more cocaine headed, headed uh, for Europe than there will be for the United States. Um, <clears throat> let me try to put this into perspective now. You've got the Hezbollah in West Africa and North Africa uh, involved in their cocaine trafficking activities. You've got Al-Qaeda in the Islamic uh, Maghreb that's involved in that activity. Uh, you've got traditional organized crime uh, entities or groups from that, from that, uh, from that area. Uh, you've got uh, AQA, uh, uh, AP that's more and more involved in that activity. But now you have representatives from Mexican drug trafficking and Colombian drug trafficking cartels, including the FARC, reminding you that that's also a designated terrorist organization that are firmly in place now in West and North Africa. And what's happening? Uh, I, I know, based on my many years of experience, uh, that these guys are building close personal relationships because they're, again, staying in the same seedy hotels. Uh, they're sharing the same, uh, same prostitutes in the same brothels, and they're uh, bumping into one another in the same, uh, you know, in the same sweaty bars, uh, because places like Guinea-Bissau, where there are so many of them are, are now coming together, uh, there's just no place else to go to stay. There's no place else to go to drink, and I don't want to sound too crude, but there are only so many prostitutes in that uh, in that in that country, and in that city. And so all these guys are now coming together and they're forming close personal relationships and here's what worries me more than anything else. I don't care if you're the leader of a Mexican or a Colombian cartel or uh, part of the executive secretariat of the FARC or you know, you're the head of the AQIM or Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah. You send your toughest young sergeants and lieutenants to places like that because they've got a proven track record of moving your agenda forward. And these folks, by nature, are type A personalities on steroids, and they are naturally going to ascend through the ranks of their respective organizations. So these personal relationships that are being developed today, as we speak, in my mind, it's as clear as can be, are going to evolve, develop, evolve into inter-organizational strategic relationships of the future if it's not already happening. And there are some indications that it is already happening. It's one thing for us to know, like we've known for a long time, that Hezbollah's got the ability to pick up the phone and, and call Hamas corporate or Al-Qaeda and ask for a favor in certain parts of the world. It's entirely something different when you think that a member of AQIM may be able to pick up the phone someday if it's not happening already and call someone from the Sinaloa cartel or the Federation in Mexico or the FARC or what's left of the Norte Valle car cartel in Colombia. It's a threat that we need to be focused on and we're, we're really not. My last comment would be this. Please take this back to your bosses. We seem, with respect to the southwest border, we seem to be absolutely obsessed with developing a strategy to defend the one-yard line. Anyone that's ever played any kind of sport understands um, the danger of that. You can't develop a strategy to, 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 to basically defend the one-yard line. It's not going to work. It will be defeated. 
the best of technology will be defeated. The largest fence or the largest, largest wall be, will be defeated by these, uh, by these powerful threats. We need a defense in depth. We need, we need a lot more resources downrange that were pulled out right after 9-11 and quite frankly have not been backfilled. And I'm not just talking about the DEA, I'm talking about our military and just about every three-letter agency, security agency, and our government security apparatus is not down there in the numbers that they used to be in. And look at what's happened to, happening to us. Nicaragua, Venezuela, I mean, Mexico, Bolivia, okay? We've got some major challenges that need to be addressed.